John, we've known you for, I think, what, 10 years? Yeah. Okay, long time. And I, I know you've, you've come up with some great analogies, which I would love to go into later. I know you talk about the red carpet producer, which I still love that, that term. Anyway, mm -hmm. but one thing I want to ask you about is, and I heard you say it somewhere else, you said being in Hollywood and staying here for a length of time will not maybe change you, but it'll just make you more of what you already are? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Or? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was the advice that was given to me many years ago before I moved out here by a person who had worked in Hollywood with Jerry Bruckheimer. And he said, that, John, you, you want to take a really good stock of yourself here now because everything that you do here, everything that you think, everything that you believe, everything that you indulge in, good or bad, it will be available to you out here at a much greater level and degree and things that you don't even know about will are abundant. And you said you will become more of who you are rather than it changing you you'll actually be able to fulfill all of those things that are both inside of you and how you feel and the way you see the world and the kind of friends that you hang out with and the things that you go and do in your spare time and so I took that to heart. I didn't understand it other than the, you know, observable, okay, he's telling me to think about myself and think about who I am deeply. Uh, I wasn't worried in that regard, but uh, in my 18 years out here, um, I would say that that statement is still very true today. Um, not just for myself, but for any of us. I, I think it's it's um, Hollywood affords you a lot of things, not just the film industry, but Los Angeles. It's abundant. It's abundant everywhere you want to go. There are several Starbucks within walking distance. There are multiple places and things that you can do. And there's also a variety of people that maybe in your small town, there were only one or two. There are now dozens, if not hundreds. And a lot of them have uh, money. So. You know, taking that into perspective and, and looking at these last several years of growth, um, it can challenge you too. And the only answer that I have for that is really to look deeper within yourself. And some of those things that you have to look deeper within can be painful. They can uh, cause you to uh, feel disappointed about when you don't get what you want, uh, when you create something that is not received well, when you, um, when you don't win the uh, approval of certain people that you maybe want to work with or have access to or get to quote the next level. Um, but fundamentally, I think what it teaches you, that discipline of introspection uh, is one where you become more fulfilled and happy because of what you are actually doing that is true to yourself as opposed to trying to worry about what others outside expect of you you have to start with your own internal expectations and those things may evolve but they they can only evolve because of you not because of someone else giving you an opportunity or not or someone else approving of you or not ultimately at the end of the day how you feel about yourself is is person that's up in here and what's in here and that personal commitment was the one that I found in my journey to go through Hollywood which was who is really who am I who am I truly inside and what do I really believe about this world looking at things with new eyes being critical of myself not to the point where you put yourself down um, I think that's an external issue but really one where you go okay what do I want to do with my life? What are the things that I believe about this world? Do I believe in the bad things about the world? Do I also believe in the beauty of the world and what holds it all together? And how am I going to grow up? And how do I affect through art what I see and know to be true and give something to that that inspires how I feel in me to others and so it, it, it comes from a personal place where we all have journeys as artists we're sensitive we're very open people uh, 
but it, there is a, I guess you could say, if you're going to use that sensitivity to tell stories or say things, do it truthfully. Do it through the vehicle of art. And your personal commitment is one that is an evolution in yourself. So what I knew 10 years ago and what I know today is very different. But that doesn't mean that what I knew 10 years ago was wrong. It's just all I was able to do at the time, what I was capable of. And so drawing from those experiences, those hardships, even the times where you feel really down, you know, maybe even depressed in some cases, um, is not always at the time that you see that as a real opportunity, but it is in those moments that you're challenged the most that shows you not only what you're capable of, but what you're also really good at because you don't have everything going for you the way you expected it to or hoped to or wanted it to. And so you have to dig deeper. But if you're deep, you're digging deep is to blame or attack or get frustrated and say, you know, these people over here are causing me to, you know, well, they don't know you. I mean, they can do whatever they want to do, but it's about yourself and the journey through that process of becoming your truest self is the one that gives you the greatest success. At least I believe that because looking back between where I started on One Hour Fantasy Girl to now A Child's Voice and six movies later in 10 years, I am so grateful for that process because it had its ups and downs. And the only way that I can measure it is that I'm happier than I ever have been in my entire life. And I want to keep getting happier and I want to keep doing stories that are not talked about. I want to do things that help inspire the good in people because it inspires the good in me. So um, the truest part of those statements about people who are, um, you know, that it doesn't change you. Um, it's really that you do fulfill more of who you are if you allow yourself to commit to that uh, rather than trying to chase after things and make it so that, you know, somebody in Hollywood will, quote, pay attention to your work, but really go out there for the reason that you want to you wanna touch audiences, you want to touch people. I also said something years ago I didn't really understand at the time, and I think it was more because of the digital world that we were emerging in 10 years ago after the financial crash and how everything was going digital and online. Obviously, it's played itself out quite well, um, and it's still evolving, but uh, I said something that Hollywood is not the audience. It never has been. And I would say that irregardless of what Hollywood does as an industry, in its executives and, and all of those things. I think there are really great people working in there. I have no doubt that there are people that really want to make a difference and do good things in their work. But at the same time, um, chasing after those, those agendas and, and modeling yourself after them, I think really in art you can become bold and unique and different and stand out. And the only way I see people doing that is by commitment, full commitment to the belief in what they're doing, uh, such to the point that uh, it's not an issue for them about who's getting involved and not. They're determined to make the film at whatever level they have to do it with the capacity and the capabilities that they're, they're not waiting on for somebody else to come in there and, and, and you know, just say, it's okay, we got you, everything's fine now. It's really more so what's up in here and in here and trying to create that vision and align people who feel the same way you do are joining you on this journey and going through it because there's a commitment from within them. And I, I think as a producer, there is a responsibility there to set that kind of tone, uh, which is not an authoritarian one. It's one of, of your own self and attracting those kinds of people. And that's how we've been able to do the movies that we've done. Uh, because we didn't have big funders. We, we did crowdsourced, uh, we did um, our own personal funds, we brought uh, other people into the mix that were kind of like silent investors, they just wanted us to do well. And uh, I can't wait for what we do next, really can't. 
When that person said to you about, you know, Hollywood will only kind of make you more of what you already are, mm -hmm. um, what did you think at that moment? This was how long ago? 10 years? No, 18. 18, 18 sorry. 18, 19 years ago. Wow. Um, I got a little scared at first because I didn't know, like, well, what, what is he seeing, you know, in me? Um, and I knew that I had certain, uh, you know, family issues when I grew up. Um, it's kind of what got me into art, I could say, sure. uh, mm -hmm. the creative role. Um, but I think also he, he was genuinely concerned because he saw a decent person who uh, had an idealistic view. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but at the same time, it's, I think when you're younger, it's just a position not of stupidity or foolishness, but maybe just ignorance because you don't have that experience yet to know when you're tempted with, you know, something that you, you, if you had your parent there, it certainly wouldn't be happening. Uh, you know, you wouldn't be contemplating, well, maybe I should, but in the moment you don't realize that in, when you're open and you're sensitive, um, some of that can come from trauma and you don't realize that your reality as you see it in front of you is actually a reflection of that. So every choice that you make seems reasonable, but it may be coming from a place of fear. It may be coming from a place of reaction uh, where you had to do something. I mean, I, this is some of the stuff I've learned, but where people who are criminals, I'm just taking this as an extreme, uh, we see high-speed car chases all the time, right? We all know how that ends. Every time, for the last 20 years, we've been seeing how the car chase ends when the cops are following you. You don't get away. But yet, time and time again, people continue to do that. Reason being, and what I've learned in my research and my own discovery, not that I'm a criminal, but, uh, but that a lot of what we do uh, that, is, that is irrational to the outside is in fact rational to us because it's a, it's a positive behavior that warded off something else earlier in life and it's been imprinted in us that this is what gives us a positive outcome. Totally unconscious of it, totally about a set of certain, you know, like choices. You wake up every morning, you have certain choices and this person over here has a different set of choices given their environment, their background, the way they think about things. So, um, when he said that to me, I, I didn't understand the depth of it, but coming full circle now, I would give that same advice to any young person who's coming out to LA, not as a caution about them, but to be mindful of yourself and watch how you respond, how you think, how you act according to what is presented in front of you. And that takes Unfortunately, sometimes it takes experience of some very difficult uh, decisions that you make at the time that seemed right, or maybe, you know, not, uh, not so bad, but then the, at, as it played out, you realized, wow, I, I really did uh, screw up there, or I, I made a bad choice, and I went against my gut instinct. I think that's the best. I will say this to anybody who's listening that this, your gut instinct is probably your best choice. The first thing that you think about in, in reaction without knowing any information is probably the most honest of anything uh, as opposed to trying to logically talk your way through it. You know, I've had situations where I wanted certain people to be a part of our projects and didn't realize that they didn't want to be a part of our project, they needed a paycheck. Uh, fine, you know, that's their right, but because I felt that I needed them, I limited my choices to that individual and attached myself to the, the idea that I had to make that work as opposed to opening up and looking at all the other possibilities that are out there. Now, that sounds very rational and logical, but at the time, it was personal, it was emotional, that I was attached to having, needing to have that person in order to validate what I was doing and win to get it. That's my own personal issue. 
But if I'm not exploring that and looking at the consequences of that thinking and that behavior and the outcomes that it gives me, then I only have one of two choices. I'm going to be completely stubborn and, and I'm going to be, I'm going to force it or all of that time, energy and effort that I'm using, I can use to look open and outward and look at other people who may be able to, to give me those things that I want, that I truly want to find and find the best match. And um, experience has taught me that that's a very good thing to do. <laughs> so. Well, it's not just also too, I think, falling prey to temptation. I know they yeah. say sometimes like recovery meetings are held in Vegas because <laughs> what better place to test your Trauma sobriety? <laughs> yes, to test your sobriety and every trigger you have would be Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, but but uh, flattery, yeah. and that's something that as a young person, you know, you walk down the street and you get someone stopping their car and saying, "You would be perfect for this." And especially too, if you're coming with a set of let's get really therapisty tools that aren't, you know, maybe the best, that is going to be like you're going to hear angels. Mm -hmm. And so if you see that enough, then you you would be prey to other things as well. And so mm -hmm. I think flattery, and it can happen later on. It can happen, and you don't realize that sometimes you'll never hear from that person again. And that that is the thing that you kind of have to guard yourself up. Yeah, that's that's an experience that I've found. Like I've had people sit down with me, full tilt with meetings having watched our previous films, having read the script and offering a ton of things. And I'm like, this sounds great. And then nothing. And I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna introduce you to this person, that person. You know, I, I, I don't know what that person's motivations were um, or, or not, um, but to spend my time getting upset about it or, or obsessing over it or trying to figure out that person's problem and then look at, you know, I guess it only hurts me in the end, um, but I've, I've encountered that before where, you know, you can be very, you know, early on in my career out here as an actor, in fact. Um, <laughs> yep, they <laughs> it, exist. <laughs> it, it is, it's, uh, you, know, you know, going out on a, on a business meeting and having things not, you know, I mean, we're talking about an era of me too. It, it happens to guys too. Oh, it's sure. never been talked about, but there are, you know, there are people in Hollywood who, um, you know, they have a right to do what they want, but when they cross the line of kind of putting you in a position where, you know, you're not, um, you're not able to conduct, the, you know, yourself as a person and have to kind of adjust according to them, it's now you're kind of, you're, you're, you're selling yourself into something that is really not about you anymore. It's about what you do for that person. And, um, and it is easy, you, you know, compliments are very easy to give, but at the same time you have to have your own center, your own self-worth, so that you know that if you're, if you're dealing in business and you want, you know, you are talented and you believe your talent or you have something to offer, find somebody who's looking for that in you. Like, you know, the, the look and everything, I mean, I, I do cast all of our films and I have seen random people that I've gone up to and I say, you know, you have a really great presence just, just, and I, and I said, you know, I'd really like to see what you look like on camera. And I mean that in, truthfully, because I love discoveries of talent. This sure. is how we've been able to make all of our movies with these talented people who are not union. Most of them are not. And, uh, and not because I'm against the union, but it just has to do with cost and everything else that we're trying to do. And we pay everybody. But, but it has more to do with, you know, like being authentic and being genuine and, and being professional. And I think you can be all of those things and still get the desired result that you want without having to do all this other kind of stuff, which is more of like, I'm going to make you feel good so I can get something from you, which is all I have to offer you is the truth according to what I see. And that could be totally wrong. And you tell me, hey, go screw yourself, you know, like get lost. But that's your right. All I'm doing is making it an attempt to try to say, hey, I see something here. I think there's something really good here, and I'd like to. I'd like to see if it, it's going to work for what I want to do. When you think back to producing One Hour Fantasy Girl, which mm -hmm. forgive me, that was your first mm -hmm. producing credit. Mm -hmm. Okay, to now you have six, and then you have two more or more in the pipeline, mm -hmm. right? Okay, mm -hmm. what? How has your vision of being a producer changed? So mm -hmm. the first one, you know. 
you had this one set of ideals and beliefs and now all the way to to this mm -hmm. these upcoming projects so um i think when i when i got into hollywood uh and as a producer, I had been working for three years to get one project off the ground that fell apart within a weekend. Oh, wow. That was, yeah, that was, a, and that happened in 2007. So Edgar and I had been working for Edgar Bravo, the writer director, who was my business partner at No Restrictions. Uh, he and I had been working for years to try to get these projects off the ground. There were like two or three of them. And we had gotten very far. I mean, we were talking about like, you know, getting into CAA, getting into the studio system, getting meetings with people that could make things happen like very quickly if they got behind you. And um, so we had amassed a good momentum and we had put a large portion of the financing together. So when we did One Hour Fantasy Girl, I was not happy. To be quite honest, I wasn't happy because we were starting from a budget on another project of 2.5 million and now we were going to tens of thousands of dollars and you know it's a huge drop off sure. there mm -hmm. <laughs> and um and so emotionally it's it's very difficult because you want to be where you had the potential you always knew that you had the potential it was validated by all these other people that said you were good took meetings with you based on the script you know that kind of stuff that those are meaningful things you go over to 20th century fox and you're meeting with the head of you know the vice president of production who read your script and wants to take a meeting with you it's a pretty big deal Absolutely. and you don't have any agent or representation that's a big deal that you feel good about that so to lose all of that and start from square one <laughs> um it was i was upset i loved the script when i read the first draft that he had made uh it 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 stayed with me for hours and I knew that that was always where I wanted to go was to make films that you know I, I that were move moving to me I didn't have to sit there and think about it it was just like it stirred in my head so that was the motivation to get back to where we were by doing that film so what I wanted you know obviously when I created that movie I wanted it to launch our career I wanted it to change everything, the, the, the doors were going to open because now all the relationships that I had been building up for the last three and a half years would see a product of something that I was able to do on a micro budget. And it got critical acclaim and it did really well in sales. I mean, we had, we were talking to people at Netflix, the head, uh, Ted, uh, I forgot his last name, but the CEO, uh -huh. I mean, this is still when they were smaller and still open, but they can't, I mean, I wrote to him in an email and he handed me off to one of the, yeah, I mean, wow. it was, it was serious. It wasn't like, um, you know, and I know all these things, I mean, it's, it's frustrating for filmmakers when they hear that because everybody wants that. But at the same time, um, my idea of producing was to get into the Hollywood studio system and become a big producer and have, you know, lots of money. Um, but I didn't realize that in essence what we were doing was we were separating ourselves from that part of the industry. Not that I reject them or think that they're wrong or anything like that. I, I mean, they, it's their business, they can do whatever they want. But today, coming forward six films later and we have the internet and we have alternative media and you have other methods and ways in which you can reach thousands of people very quickly with little to no overhead, um, that's, that's the sweet spot for me as, a, as an independent film producer. I mean, you have to imagine there are also companies now that exist kind of like ours, not as production companies, but companies out of New York and elsewhere that have a team of people and an overhead and a set budget that actually go out and do the same work that I'm actually doing as a producer one-on-one -on -one with all of these different people in the alternative media because the, the subject matter speaks directly to that group of people. Whereas in a larger system where you have more overhead, you have more risk, you have a lot of other things, you have to spend millions of dollars to ensure that you're going to get a delivery on payout for your investment and your distributors and all your talent and everything else that's in there. So. They are hiring these companies now to go and find these groups of people that exist online in these communities and market the film to them. Um, 
It's quite interesting. Now, it's not first tier distribution level. Obviously, it's not theatrical and it's not uh, television cable. But these second er secondary areas like social work groups and, and other groups that are dealing with causes and, and, and all of that, they, they would have to cast as wide of a net as possible and spend tens of millions of dollars to possibly reach those people where if you go directly to them today and you have credibility and you, and you create a relationship with the person who's interviewing you, all of a sudden you're opened up to their entire audience. And we're talking like thousands of people. Some of these people on YouTube have two, three, four hundred thousand or more subscribers. They also have Patreon, which, you know, is another and you get email blasts. I mean, we saw when we went out and did with a child's voice, our latest film on human trafficking, we went directly to these individuals. And the moment that we did the interview and it was published and the moment that that Patreon went out, we're talking like hundreds of sales wow. within days on Vimeo, on Vimeo alone. And we haven't even gone to Amazon and done prime and all of that. So, when you're when you're looking at that and you're seeing the potential plus the reaction the reactions are instant with these you know they're they're writing comments in the youtube comments they're writing them on imdb they're writing them on a vimeo organically organic growth organic spread you go on doing keyword search on twitter you know and you look at how all none of these people follow you they don't even follow people that you follow they heard about it they shared it they were moved by it you receive comments you receive emails you hear firsthand testimonies from people. I mean, these are the things that I feel are far more important than trying to um, get access to the industry and their press machine, which is important, don't get me wrong, sure. but relying solely on that to make your message of your movie and your work get out there. So today, from 10 years ago to now, I'm not saying, you know, this system's wrong. But I'm saying there are other opportunities out there that can fulfill what you want to do that don't have to mean going through the Hollywood media and the Hollywood studio system in order to achieve what you really want to do. So for me, the evolution was one of feeling I had to be a part of that and included in it to be important or successful. And instead, realizing that my work and my commitment to it and the people that it's affecting was the best, that's like the best compliment you could ever get. Uh, you know, when you read stories about people who have gone through some of these hardships, not from a news report, but they're personally telling you that I'm so glad that, that you are doing this. I, I, I've, I'm glad that Hollywood is finally addressing this or someone out there heard us. Um, when you meet the victims and the people that have been affected by uh, a message that you're trying to show of what's going on out there, um, that is the most, I, personally at this stage in my career, that is the most rewarding thing that I have. Um, and obviously I would love to be able to to reach a larger group of people. I would love to be able to work with people in Hollywood who see what we're doing is important. I've been told by producers who've done big time series, big time television shows, movies. They're like, this is exactly the kind of stuff that we need to be promoting. These are the kinds of stories we need to be telling. We need to educate people on the realities of the world that's going on around us. Um, so that has become now my mission, I guess. It's not a political agenda. It's one of, of the search of your journey through yourself and, the, and what you believe about the world around you. So it's become something bigger. It's become something, I guess you could say, I don't want to like, freak people out, but it's spiritual in the sense of the human self in your heart, in your mind, uh, trying to find your deeper purpose on this planet while you're still alive and you have this human family of 7.2 billion people in the world that uh, need help. They need help. They need to, they need honesty. They need art. They need, we need the, all the things that we talk about when we need art, we need, we don't need to destroy art. We need to promote art and art comes from a truthful place within you. And the more we do that, um, I think the better the world can get. At least I'm trying to do my one part 
you know, in this little tiny space in the world that I occupy online and in, in reality. So I guess you could say that's been my evolution in the last 10 years of where I saw myself 10 years ago and where I saw myself today. And quite honestly, if you had told that guy in 2008 that this is where I'd be today, I'd go, nope, <laughs> I don't want that. But the guy that I am today, looking back at, at my, you know, my younger self, I would say, dude, go for it. You have everything to gain from this experience. And wherever the cards fall or the chips may fall, you can walk through it all, learning about yourself, learning about the world around you and affecting people in real and meaningful ways. And I mean, that's just me. That's, that may not be everybody, but I, I, I would say as a filmmaker, if we pride ourselves on telling stories that matter and mean something to people, then maybe we look at how we, how we tell stories, who we tell stories to and for, who do, who, who do we serve, who do we go out there to embrace and partner with to help get this message out, like organizations or communities online that exist, social workers. I mean, it doesn't have to all be social issue stuff, but, it, but, it, but it's a human thing to reach out and connect with others rather than standing back here and sort of being in the industry and loved by the industry and everything else. But really, that's fine. You know, having friends and, you know, connecting with others in the industry and having your peers and your allies, that's great. But really, we're looking at how do we nourish people's minds and hearts? How do we bring out, you know, when you show something that's honest and truthful, how you perceive it, how he perceives it, how the next person does. It's, it's a call to action inside of you. It's up to you what you want to do or what you want to take from it or don't. But the purpose should be to try to impact someone, show somebody something that they haven't seen before, something that you learned in the journey of making this movie about yourself and the world around you. Maybe, maybe we could do that a little bit more and focus on that. And if we really do want to change the world for the better, we could start there, possibly. And not only impacting others, but, and, and I don't mean to sound selfish, but also finding a reason to keep doing it ourselves because most people don't make it through six plus films. They just don't, it's too hard. Yeah. You, you get knocked down too much. You get too many of these meetings. Oh, it's so great. Thank you so much. Love you. And you never hear from them. Mm -hmm. And then you, most people do give up. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer Coolidge, who's one of my favorite actresses, uh, told me many years ago, she goes, uh, I only believe the people who love my work are the ones that, are, the ones that hire me. <laughs> and, you know, everybody says, great job, congratulations, and, and then they don't, never again, right? You, we've all experienced that. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, that part of it is discouraging, and, uh, you know, I got down quite a bit. Um, after my third or fourth film, there was a period of time where it was just, uh, I, I wasn't motivated. I wanted to be, but I wasn't. And it forced me to take stock of what I was really in this for. Would I continue? Would I go get a job somewhere else? Would I leave the film industry? Of course I could. I mean, you know, it's, I can leave on my own terms anytime. Anybody can. Sure. But um, it was searching from within to find a meaning for what you cared about life and of yourself and that expression and the taking care of this person in here will manifest outward. Um, and I would say that there was a, a, a period of time, even as I was making movies, still producing, uh, where I wasn't, I, you know, I, I focused on the casting, I focused on the logistics, I focused on doing all the tasks and everything, and I still brought good people together. But in this last one, what it taught me more than any of the other films, doing a child's voice, not because of just the subject matter, but the relationship to the feeling I had coming through learning about all of what human trafficking is and how it impacts all of us everywhere in the seen and unseen ways. 
inspired me to do the best job I've ever done producing a film and had the best experience on set with the best group of people I've ever had the opportunity to work with collectively. And they all loved each other. That was, that was such a beautiful thing to watch when you have your cast and your crew and everybody's already wanting to do a good job and then you see it all come together in this beautiful spirit. And, and we're talking like, you know, 14 hours of work and they're heading off down the road, dancing in the street <laughs> and going to get ice cream. And, and, and I mean, we're talking about like, you know, a DP and other people that come from, you know, extensive backgrounds, some of them very accomplished. I mean, they didn't need to work on our movie in terms of the trajectory of their career. We found people that were into the art, wanted to do it because of the art of it. Didn't look at it as like, I'm doing you a favor, but it wasn't, that wasn't even the starting point. The starting point was, wow, these are really great characters. You guys seem like really good people. I want to do it. It wasn't, it wasn't a question. I mean, we had like guys, uh, lead role guy, come all the way down from Fresno on a bus just for the audition. And that was his dedication. Never been in a lead role ever in anything uh, of a feature. Um, it's totally green in terms of, you know, experience, but he had raw talent. He had a spark. Uh, Angela, who played the co-lead, she, I saw her in a GoPro film doing uh, jet skiing. And I saw a spirit in her that I just wanted to see. And I went to her YouTube channel and saw she was playing guitar and singing. She had like this, this, this beauty in her. I didn't know if she was going to be talented or not, but her spirit and her essence of what I saw, I felt had something to offer in this. And then once all of us sat down, of course, we had different choices for cast and we we're going through all that. But everything just lined up and made this thing come together and happen and it worked beautifully in such a way that when we got to that premiere, and this is the greatest joy that, you know, the red carpet premiere, <laughs> the red carpet producer. I love your analogy of it. Yeah. I, I just, it's, it's like the, from the moment you read the script and your journey through this to create, and then you get to that night and it's just this energy, this beautiful energy of everybody's excitement. They're nervous. They're like, ah, you know, they're like, they're, they're going up to each other, hugging each other. I had people on the outside who had hired for this premiere to videographer and a photographer and they, we did an after party. They all came with us. They had already gotten paid. They could have gone home, you know, after the show. And I had a couple of filmmakers, one of them was a filmmaker and she said, I have never been to a place like a premiere like this where just everybody is just so excited and happy and loving. And we were talking about like 400, almost 400 people, uh, you know, cast crew, their friends and all, but, but a bunch of strangers coming in. And there was just this goodwill in, in the audience, both during the film and after. And they, they didn't want to leave. They stuck around. Till, I think we, we, we ended up closing down um, Barney's Beanery at like 1.30 <laughs> in the morning. I mean, the, the premiere, the film started at like 7 something. It got out and whatever. And then, and then there's just hours of people sticking around and like talking. And you just see like that the, this is what it, this is what makes it worthwhile. I mean, in, in terms of making these kinds of films and, and the moment you read the script to seeing it up on a big screen in a large audience of people and they're, they're just, they're enjoying your work for the first time and you can kind of, I mean, you, you can look, but you kind of get a sense in the vibe and all that. It's just beautiful. It, it just, it validates, that to me validates everything that you just did and how people are emotionally impacted afterwards. Not what they come up and say to you necessarily as a compliment. I watched everybody else out there and how the actors and actresses and the families were so proud of them. I mean, just like, this is, this is what we're trying to do. This is what, what, to me, and maybe that's an idealistic thing. Maybe in 10 years I'll change that. But I have never, I wish I could do that every single day, everywhere, with new audiences all the time and bringing everybody together. Um, it's just a, it's a really beautiful, beautiful feeling and, and it, and it, and it's, those are the great memories that you have. I believe you told your two actors, Angela and Joey, that, um, that they should kind of cherish this time mm -hmm. because they're in a really interesting space right now. And I was wondering how you could apply that same analogy to producers, mm -hmm. other filmmakers. 
Yeah, so I, I told them, I mean, you're young. You know, they're, they're extremely young. They're 19 and 22. And I said, you don't get many opportunities like this, not only as a lead role, but um, to do something that not only you're proud of, but that other people have validated both in the industry and outside. And I said, you need to strike while it's hot because these opportunities don't come along every day. Sometimes it's once in a career uh, where you can move up to the next level if you're smart. And what I mean by that is you, you need to strike while the iron's hot, you know, because two years will go by like that and, and, and it'll be over. You know, it won't. People will take a look at you, you will have a body of work, and you have critical acclaim uh, and validation from different points of view about a success of a movie. Now, some people define success by the money that it generates at the box office, but other people look at it and go, oh, wow, you sustained an entire performance in a, in a feature film that, that has this. And what, what makes it unique for them is that they, uh, they have a lot to learn, but that they have an opening, a door that has opened. And it will close, but as a producer, what does that mean for me? Uh, or any artist, a filmmaker in general, is that you do need to strike while the iron is hot, and you do need to have a plan going into it, a game plan of how you're gonna attack uh, getting your movie out there, uh, in whatever capacity that you're capable of doing. That's the one thing I don't think about, you know, like some people want to wait and, and, you know, kind of wait for that perfect storm and everything. But I, I actually think that once you've gotten to the point where you're satisfied with where your film is, like in terms of the picture lock and all, all of the elements and you're, and you're going, okay, this is the film we've created, get it out there and you don't give up. You, you try it one way, it doesn't work, you come up with another idea. You go over here and look at this, maybe this, maybe that, maybe this. You exhaust every option that you have simply for the fact that it's your baby, you own it, you're gonna own it for the rest of your life, and you might as well do everything you possibly can, both now and in the future, to ensure that the film has a place that you can be proud of. And if you can't, which is fine, learn from it, take the lessons that you learned from it, and try to do something else. Not necessarily abandon what you, but take that as your, your learning bar. You know, your, your, in other words, one film is not gonna define you. One moment is not gonna define you. But if you don't take advantage of it, to try to fulfill it to its fullest potential, you will not learn anything and you're, you're seeding that over to other people to determine the fate of it. Whereas if you take what's available to you and what you believe in and you innovate as opposed to locking in and saying I, it, it can only be this way. Um, it can only go through a distributor. It can only, I and have to have Lionsgate. I have to have this actor, or it's not this. And so for them, from the actor to the producer, it's incumbent upon yourself to understand, even without experience, to understand that this is a very unique opportunity for you to learn through your craft, what to do better the next time. In all those moments that are challenging to you is the greatest period of growth that you can ever have. If you do not look at it that way, it may not be the right fit for you to go down this road because adversity is always gonna be staring you at the face even with a 40 or $50 million or $100 million budget. I've talked to producers who tell me, no, the challenge is always the same. You're always going to be limited. You just from me looking out there up to what they have, I go, wow, yeah, what, I, what could I do with a, a Rogue One you know, budget? Wow, that's amazing. But even still, those producers, and I've talked to one of them, have challenges accord that are you know, reflective of their current environment. There's always going to be time that you're going to lose. There's always going to be money that's going to be an issue but it just, it's just scaled up. It's the same, these are the same issues that just scaled up. So 
as a producer, it's my job that if I believe in what I'm doing to not give up, but also if I'm going to be a successful producer and do six movies and some hit, some don't, some are received well, some aren't. You know, if I'm committed to what I'm doing, I've got to learn from those mistakes. And here's the thing, you own that film. You can always go back and re-edit it. You, if you see that there's another story there that you didn't see at the time, we've done that with two of our movies. We're doing one of them now, A Young Man's Future, about schizophrenia and college students. We're coming back and man, with fresh eyes, it's like a beautiful story, more powerful than ever before. And it's just story. Because all the elements were there, it was just how you arrange the story, what you focus on, maybe where some things meander a little bit, cut that out, concise story points. And um, I've seen it now, like twice, so I know that those are possibilities as well. Um, and we're going to go out to a whole new group of people. We're not going to go back and retread all the critics and say, hey, this is the director's cut. I mean, maybe if they want to review it, sure. But there's other audiences out there that we can, we can hit with a new release of a movie or a recut. And that's just through the discovery of looking at the footage and, and seeing that there, there's another story there. There was a, an example of this, uh, Cretia. It was an independent film that was written. It was written in, uh, I think it came up in Vanity Fair like three, four years ago about how this filmmaker, I can't remember his name, this is a, he, he, did an edit of, he did an edit of the film and it wasn't received well and he was just like, I failed. And then he went back and he retooled it and made this compelling drama about a woman, an older woman, yes. coming home to I've Thanksgiving. Seen it. Yeah, extremely, it's powerful. extremely mm -hmm. well done. But the first cut of that movie was not the one you saw, and he said it just meandered all over the place. So he just started switching things up, throwing throwing scenes that were written for here, threw them to the front, changed things around, pared it down to this 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 build of a, an explosion, right? An emotional explosion because you're seeing the, 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 the part of her that is this, this troubled individual right. and all of her vices and addictions sure. with trying to reconcile you know, what she really wants, which is the closeness to her family. Anyway, it, it, it speaks to those things where there is a story there. There was always a story there. It's just you have to find it because obviously you know, they say the one you wrote, the one you shot, and the one that's edited but then there's also the one that how it's received. And that feedback that people give you, even if it's diametrically opposed to what your vision is, or is, uh, quote, not positive, you can learn from how people are responding. Not because what they're saying is an accurate assessment, but there's something in there that is, is not working for them, logically, when they're watching a story. And if you hear that from like four or five different people, then you got to kind of like say, okay, what's, what, where's the truth in all of what they're telling you? Right. And so you take that and you learn that lesson and you go, okay, what's next? Actors, actresses, filmmakers, producers, you got to go, what's next? Do you believe in that sort of, you know, cliche saying that it's no longer your film once it's out there? It's now, it's now, it belongs to the audience. Yeah, I know that's such a, I, a, a cliche. I don't know. Story. I've never really, um, I've never really thought of it that way. I mean, you can, I guess, but um, it should, to me, it's kind of like a shared experience. Um, you know, you, you, Denzel Washington talked about this years ago, you know, I'm gonna, you know, making a film is like baking a, a cake or a pie or something. He said, you're gonna bake it, you're gonna put all these ingredients in, you're gonna bake it, and then you're gonna serve it to people. And some people are gonna go, wow, this is the best cake I've ever tasted. And other people go, wasn't that good? But all you can do is bake the cake. It's a great analogy. Yeah, I just rewatched a million dollar, million dollar baby, and I, I just felt that like Hilary Swank was, she was made for that role. Mm -hmm. Like I can't imagine any other actor in that role. Right. And and I had forgotten about how emotional it was. And we interviewed someone, and they were talking about it. I was like, you know what, I want to see it. And so, and then I, you go online, you go under the trailer, and you and you see, just. The, the divided nature, I mean, how could someone not like, especially her character, right. it's so excellent. But 
subjective it's, yeah subjective you know. to the interpretation <laughs> of the individual hey you know what if uh i mean there's another movie i saw years ago um the follow-up from the director of drive oh nicholas red uh whining red yeah, yeah he did one called only god forgives with ryan gosling right I can and see that. that was panned across the board and I personally, I find that movie so fulfilling. Now there's probably gonna be people that listen, it's like, wow, that was a terrible film. Um, but it was saying things that are very difficult and very ugly about this particular world that he brought us into. And uh, the critics didn't like it. Um, there are some esoteric things, you know, I, I would agree, you know, concede that this is, it's not a typical American movie, the way it's paced, the way it's edited, the dialogue is very sparse, but there's a feeling and an undertow to the whole thing. Uh, I mean, but you go online and you look at Amazon, you would have thought this is the worst movie ever made, ever, hmm. by some people's opinions. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're, the opposite is true, but it's just subjective to that person's, like, their world and what they're wanting to see. They like Drive for a number of reasons. Sure. This one was totally the opposite. It was even darker. It was a darker world, an underbelly of like prostitution and um, you know smuggling and drugs and murder and I mean just just a criminal underground world in Thailand. Hmm. And it's scary because it's it's presented in a very realistic way. There's violence. There's gore. There's there's nobody really there that you relate to and that I think was the underlying issue at that film is that there's really nobody there to root for um, uh. because Ryan Gosling is a victim of his mother and his mother runs the whole show that that arguably is one of the best uh, performances of a female that I've ever seen I mean just for acting purposes in terms of daring and Kristen, I, I was it Kristen Scott Thomas? Oh, I love her. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would never. That's somebody that you would never expect in that role, and she just like blew me away with the the audacity of that character. Just see that because she was in Life as a House, and here she's this very together, <laughs> composed. You know. Yeah, I see her. Uh, she played. You know, like a lot of good. And then this one, she's like a narcissistic mother who is. It's gross, but wow. she's 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 amazing. That that was another level of, of acting I'd never seen out of her. Yeah, and, and then people are you know online just saying I didn't like this. I don't like these people. This isn't good acting. You know, I, I don't know. But th again, it's subjective to the audience, and you can only you can only make the film. And you know, when you make something that you know is going to get a polarizing reaction. Mm -hmm. You know, and you hear that other sort of things. I just want someone to react to it. I don't really care if they love it or hate it. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's important if you're okay with that. I think it, you can't always, I know somebody I talked to years ago that I work with, he said, oh, I hate indie film. There's never a happy ending. It's confusing. <laughs> it's like, I, I can't stand those people. And I thought, that's why I love indie film though. I, I don't want to know the end. I, to, I want to be thinking about it for weeks after, right. you know? Yeah. I don't want it all neat and then there's a, the great 80s soundtrack and people are holding hands walking off in the sunset. So, but if you make something, and, and I know all the films that you and, and Edgar Michael Bravo have made, mm -hmm. they, they touch on some very intense subjects. Mm -hmm. And I think going into that, you, you know that it's going to get a reaction from people. Yeah, I think I think if you if as an artist you've uh, you've gotten a reaction out of somebody, you've done your job, at minimum. If they ignore you and they don't care and just like yeah, you know, okay, that's that hurts. That that to me hurts more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When I see people online like you know writing horrible stuff about our movies, and I'm just like, wow, this really affected you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, in a way that I don't agree with it. I'll try to understand, you know, where they're coming from, and 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 I and and some of them I concede. I mean, I'm not like writing back to them, but some of them I concede they have valid, you know, issues. But some of it also is very personal, and sure. and so mm -hmm. their emotions. Like, I mean, I've had certain people obviously go online, and and I mean, like, of all the things you had to say about our film, you attacked it on these merits that have nothing to do with the movie, uh, you know, but. It's going to happen. People are people, and the internet obviously gives a lot of cover and anonymity to people who wouldn't dare come up to you and say it in person, no. but they can from behind their keyboard. And you know there's an agenda with every comment. 
whether it's their own agenda or whether it's to, to discredit you, whatever, there's an agenda and right. if you can see it for what it is, but sometimes you don't always know what it is. Yeah, you just, I mean, if it provokes a response and it, and it incites a response in you, again, you just have to realize, okay, am, am I gonna really spend the time? Does this person wanna have a conversation with me and ask me certain things? Are they wanting to tell me who I am and, and that they know what, you know? Right. That's where you just kinda have to go, okay, that's just, that's who they are. Mm -hmm. What comes first, the budget or the script? Script. Script dictates the budget. Um, script is your heart and soul, the, the spine of the whole thing that you're going to build off of, the foundation of everything that you're going to lay on top of it. Uh, and if you have money first and you're writing to the budget of that, uh, I think your creativity is, is paramount. Uh, and then dealing within the realities of you know, what's, what resources are available to you, right? And then you start talking about money and how you're going to fulfill that vision. But if the vision is coming from a monetary, I, me personally, I, I've had more money on some of my other films. Didn't mean I did a better job producing. In fact, my third film, Mother's Red Dress, I had more money than any of the other ones. And uh, it was my worst job producing. Why? Do you think that because I, I because I thought that by having more money to pay more money to each position and person in, that was working on it, I was just going to get better talent, and therefore I took my 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 better part of myself out of the equation. Just that it was going to be solved by money. Hmm, interesting. And and I learned a, a very valuable lesson on that. We got the film done, and everything was great, and it worked out fine. But um, I I saw dollars and that I could get this kind of DP, and it didn't translate into success for the project. In fact, the person that I brought on, once that DP left the project for another project in the middle of shooting, um, yeah, I brought in somebody else that had less equipment, less experience, and he did a fantastic job because his motivation was correct. So, so if, you, if you look at it from this standpoint, if you have money and you're gonna pay people, Right. I mean, we all want to get paid and we got to work to live and all that. But but if that is the focus first, then I think that the then, then you're doing the opposite. It's like, OK, we've got a marketing campaign we can do. Now let's find a script if it's, you know, the, the kind of content that we want to sell as opposed to what comes from within. Do you think you didn't screen the people properly because they were so ready to take the paycheck that you didn't see the commitment in them? Um, I think it was a combination of that and just thinking that um, maybe I had, you know, was trying to. Um, I think I, I I took my vigilance off. And, and, and not qualifying people on a level. Now, I had a great time working with all of those individuals, but I could have avoided a lot of problems had I, had I done better vetting of my cast and my crew. Um, that's not to say I regret any of it because it was a learning experience and we got a film done and we did a really good job with it and it, it impacted a lot of people. But in terms of my job as a producer, I, I stepped away from certain things and just figured they were gonna take care of themselves because I had more money. Gotcha. That was a mistake I made. So on a movie like A Child's Voice, where do you spend the most money? Uh, well, cast crew and all the logistics, the locations, uh, the food and uh, equipment and insurance and all that. And you know, it, it all, like it goes into the personnel. Um, it's it's all the below the line and bubble, but but not for us. I mean, it's it's a labor of love on that point. Uh, you know, our our stuff is is not to pay ourselves. Uh, that's just me. But uh, but uh, but all of it goes into the the planning, uh, the implementation, and then also what I try to do is I always look at the budget every couple of days. Uh, and start to try to figure out where I can get donations, where I can get discounts, where I can, where I can smartly schedule things better so that we're not spending double the money to get the same thing that we could in, in one day over here if we, if we plan it better or, or smartly uh, write it, you know, write it in a way that doesn't require, because you just got to look at what you're trying to say. 
right? What are you trying to say with a scene, with each scene? Do we need, really need to, to stretch it out or can we consolidate it here and maybe combine some things? So it's, it's a team effort between me and Edgar, but mine is always to, to try to find things that are reducing costs and overhead every single time. Well, you had the hotel, mm -hmm. and was that somewhere in like Riverside? Or? It was in Riverside. Okay, so be cheaper than LA, I'm sure. Probably. Right, yeah. and, and Riverside is cheaper to film with permits and everything. And you still have to do all the paperwork and everything else, but it's not, uh, it's not expensive. Um, they've, it's gone up a little bit in the last couple of years because they have more filming out there now. But this, the county of Riverside is fantastic. Those two women that run it, they're fantastic. As long as they're there, I think they'll, they'll do really, really well. City of Riverside is independent of that. But the county of Riverside opens you up to so many other things. They have location services that they'll help you with. Um, we went to seven or eight different motels in different groups and I drove out there and I lobbied all of them. Um, Wait, what's that like? Sorry. Huh? What's that like? Oh, it's difficult. You're going to meet a lot of a lot of people that don't uh, care, and and but some people, when you talk to them and just tell them what you're doing and what it's about, and 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 you know the realities of what you're dealing with. I'm dealing with a crew of eight people. I've got you know this many actors coming in. I I need this kind of room. Um, can you help us out? Um, we had help. We would not have been able to make the film. Uh, without taking out more money to and away from something else potentially where I might have to raise some later if it wasn't for that manager at that particular hotel who gave us a discount um, because he was personally invested in that issue. And, it, and, and you never know how things are going to come, but that came from a relationship from his brother who knew the person who had endorsed our previous film in a letter of writing. It just so happened that he knew who he was told these guys, yeah, whatever they're doing, if they're backed by this guy, you help them out, whatever you can. But it wasn't, it was who he was, the owner, and the heart that he had for this issue. I mean, he came all the way up from Riverside with his family and his mother and father to the premiere. Wow. And continued to help us afterwards by um, taking us into this hotel association the Asian American Hotels Owner Association, nobody knows about this, but 18,000 members, one, one out of every two hotels in the country. And one of their core tenants of what they're, they're fighting against is human trafficking in their chains. And they have a program, this is like a top program, where all of their members have to receive training from the top down, down to the housemates, about how to correctly identify the signs of human trafficking, how to document it, and how to get local law enforcement and local services, government services involved to get it out of there and still help the kid because the kid's life's in danger once that person knows that they're tra they're there trafficking in that and that you know because they they may go somewhere else but they may do something else too and more crime may come in so these are the things that like when you connect with people because of what you're driven by you speak truthfully to that and i i, I saw a couple of people that you know I, no matter what i said to them <laughs> You just saw the lights were out. Oh, yeah. yeah. They were just like, uh-huh, sure. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll talk. And you don't hear anything else. And so it's like a day or two or three that I had to go out there and talk and, and, and meet people and leave cards and follow up. But you're talking about the difference between, you know, hundred and something dollars a night per room versus less, which enables you to do more with your budget and your crew and maybe add a day or, or whatever, or, or you know, you, you, you don't have to worry about how the hell am I going to pay for this. So it, it's, it's really valuable to go out there. Like as a producer, that's what I'd love to do. I'm a hands-on guy. I like to get involved in everything, the locations, all of it. I, I, I try to, some people take the, there's one guy, uh, Mark Storloff, I love the guy. He's like beg, barter and steal, right? Uh, and, and to me, it's like, okay, well, I'd rather not steal and <laughs> I, I don't want to beg, but I, I definitely want to align myself with people that, that kind of sure. like what we do. It's like a Grateful Dead concert. You can barter, you know, hey man, yeah. <laughs> you can have my spaghetti. And <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but the thing is though, I'm sure you could probably see in the ones that showed you some signs of life, like this person's going to be easy to work with. Whereas others, it's all about the dollar signs yeah. and you can just feel that 
they're not going to be willing to, hey, you know, we're going to run an hour late. You know, I mean, was that some of what you were dealing with, gauging their willingness? Yeah, because like if, if this was the starting point, right, this is the other thing I was kind of mentioning earlier about, you know, being fixated on, an, on a person or an idea or a way that you want to do it. You just have to adapt and go, that, that's not who they are, <laughs> you know, and just yeah. and, and save yourself the trouble because anything after that, you're going to have to be asking them for permission to do all sorts of things. And what you want to do is not to hide it from them, but you want a partner. You want somebody who understands, gives you, like when we wanted to write an additional scene, that pool scene. Right, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. at night. We came up with that while we were filming and he said, yeah, go for it. Oh, cool. Yeah, we, we didn't have to like, you know, sit there and, and negotiate, you know, something with them. They were just like, yeah, you guys do whatever you need to do. We're, they loved us. They loved, they loved seeing the film. We brought them into the room. We let them, you know, watch the film. Of course, they get bored after like 20 minutes because you know, that's how everybody does. Oh, it's like, this is it. Yeah, yeah. this is it. <laughs> but, but making them a part of it and, and showing appreciation. Um, you know, we put their name in the credits. It's very special thanks. And, and um, you know, we just... It's just as a gesture. And so if you put a gesture out there and someone gives you a gesture back, that's, it may not be everything that you want or, or envision for your movie, but you know, work with those people because they're going to be there for you when things don't go right, you know, the way you planned it. And you may need something else to happen that you didn't anticipate or something that comes up. And, and they, I mean, they were just so giving to us. It was, it was, really, a, it was really a great thing. So if you are driving out to Riverside, I don't know if you're working a full day and then you're having to get in your car, mm. but that hands-on approach versus this thing I keep throwing out, which is the red carpet producer, and I know I'm making light of it, but I remember when you told it to me years ago, and it, it, oh, I, yeah, I don't think yeah. I ever forgot it totally, and I was wondering if you could just explain yeah. to our viewers what, what it is. Well, so <laughs> there was a very, uh, my former mentor, who told me that uh, there are a lot of producers out there that um, want to have their name in a film, you know, and they want to walk the red carpet with a starlet. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of more, it's a more sort of status thing as opposed to the, uh, the producer that will be married to that project for the rest of their life. Uh, and he gave me some examples of that. So the red carpet producer, I mean, is the one that, you know, it's, it's the glamour life. It's the, it's the one where, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of just there as a, a figure that you were a part of this, yes, but you were just sort of there to cash in on the, on the experience of it as opposed to the, the filmmaking process. And that's not every producer, but there are a ton of them out there. Um, they, they, they'll they'll help make a movie and they'll put their name in the credits and, and they really just want the kind of the social benefits of all of that to kind of play and do their thing. I don't know if that, does that answer the... It, it does. I, I was thinking if, if someone though comes with a checkbook, and I know this sounds very sort of callous, but and they, you know that that's their very defined role mm -hmm. and they are like, yes, I have the money, I just want to invest in this then I feel like they get a pass, but not everybody comes with that, I realize. Right. And there are a lot of red carpet, insert any title. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of people in there that just want to, you know, uh, say they made a movie and, um, and that's fine, you know, but it's, it's, it's not producing, I don't think. Um, there, there are line producers who are amazing people. And there are creative producers that are amazing people, and there are executive producers that are amazing people. But if you just show up with a, I mean, obviously if somebody came to me with money and said, hey, we want to invest, but I'd really, it really had to be though that we have shared, shared principles, sort of in the sense that like who I am as a person, I don't want to just be taking somebody's money, not knowing who they are, not knowing, I mean, I wouldn't get involved, I wouldn't start a business with you, right? unless you and I, Karen, kind of like talk through some things and kind of go, oh yeah, we feel kind of the same way about this world and sure. you're bringing X and I'm bringing Y to this, to this vision that we're going to create and do right. something. But if somebody's just showing up hand in money and you just don't, you know, it's like... Mm. And they're flipping about it and, yeah, sounds good, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, like, oh, it's a great idea, you know, keep me posted, keep me posted. I mean, <laughs> I, I've met so many of those people that like, they, they literally walk around and um, 
actually the, the thing that kicked off One Hour Fantasy Girl was I, I now believe that that's what we had. We had a person like that. I mean, we've been offered money before, like lots of money through uh, debt instruments. You'll hear about that, that term a lot. Um, and, and it can get really tricky because ultimately the, the, the loan that you're taking out to finance your movie is on you to repay. Oh gosh. And it's no, so it's not, it's not really financing in terms of venture capital, which is risk. Mm -hmm. It's, I'm going to get paid whether this movie makes money or not, and it'll be off of your back and your name is on the loan. It's not the person providing the financing. Uh, we, we, have, we have looked at all the paperwork and there are, there are many different instruments out there they're, they're, you know, that are backed by banks. And in reality, for an independent film producer, this is, a, this is one of the dangers. I, I don't think there's been many people that have done this, but when you're a big studio and you have a whole slate of movies and you can afford to lose money in some where others will make up for the, the losses of the other, you can play that game. When you're talking about one movie and $5 million and $5 million being in your name and you're responsible for paying that back within a certain number of years, irregardless of how the film turns out, irregardless if a distributor buys your movie up only to hold it. I mean, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong that prevent you from getting that, that money back. So it's best to work with people who share your vision um, who believe that you're capable of implementing this goal, this dream, this thing you have, not just on a business plan, but when they sit, sit across from you and they're asking you questions like a smart investor would, who's cautious of where they're going to put their money, that they're not just out there uh, ready to sign up and, you know, let's make your movie, but yet at the same time, there isn't this other process that it goes through. It's kind of back to that validation when you're a young actor out here and somebody say, hey, you got a good look, <laughs> hop in the car, you know? Um, but it's the, same, it's the same thought process. You, 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 if you're investing money into a film, you want to know who you're getting involved with on both sides of that table. Because in, at the end of the day, if everything goes wrong, you don't want to be countersued. Or you don't want to sue, you don't want to counter sue. You'd rather go, hey, we tried, we're going to, you know, it didn't work. Um, you know, this is, it was all written out. Obviously, you do the contracts and everything else and everybody knows what, what the investor and the credited investor is and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you don't want to have troubles when things don't go right. You want to be able to, you know, go, hey, we all got in this together. We have the best intentions working together. We're people. And um, we, you know, I need you, you need me. If this is what we want to do to make money or tell this story or both, hopefully. And, it, and if it doesn't go the way we think it is, then we have to learn from it and move on. That's what investors, that's what good investors do. The good investors are people who have made bad investments and they've learned from making those bad investments what not to do the next time around makes them a little bit more cautious, maybe a little bit more cynical. But the only thing that you have at that point is just yourself and what you're bringing to the table. And if that person sees you as a value as to what they're trying to achieve and go, yeah, I, you, you reflect all of the qualities that I'm looking for in people that I know in other industries who invest in products and materials and businesses. You share the same qualities that these entrepreneurs do. And, and those are the kind of relationships that I want to go forward with. And I've, I've been very blessed to have those. I learned a lot of lessons early on. Red carpet producer, ready to write that check. Keep me posted, you know, and, and nothing is on the record ever. You, you will know, like, they can never put anything in writing for you. Oh. Everything will be a phone call. Let's have a conversation. Yeah. Let's talk about it. A phone call is no good. And, and especially as you get closer to meeting their, their, their stated demands or not demands, but objectives that they need to have in place in order for that investment to happen. What a lot of these guys do is they, is they get people like you and me around and they will, uh, they'll get a retainer from somebody. They get a monthly retainer to pitch projects. So if you've got somebody who's willing to get involved with you and you are getting a retainer from a group that's looking to do the financing, the, whether it be the bank or the banker or somebody else, what they're doing is they're basically presenting you uh, a, a slate of projects and the status reports every month. 
and saying, here's where we're moving on this. As of this date, we'll have this. And if projects come and go and drop off, well, then these people are, are getting that money to vet them and saying, well, they, they, you know, whatever reason they make up to this individual. And meanwhile, they could be telling you everything is going fine. And oh yeah, yeah, we've, we've seen that a couple of times. It, it's, a, it's a con and it's a scam. Um, but the, the real con is the one that they're doing and they're getting the retainer for. The, the, the worst one is when the filmmaker commits and has done so through a process really where there's no verified paper trail of anything that's been said or, and um, yeah, it, it's bad, it's bad. I, I tell pretty, people, if you can't put something in writing with anybody, yeah. don't get involved with them. Mm -hmm. That's a red flag. What are your top 10 tips for producing a movie? Top 10 tips, wow. Script, passionate about the script. Um, attack everything you do with reckless abandon in terms of your passion. And work with people that you get along with, you have mutual respect for, both in your profession as well as there's a personal identification. You don't have to agree with everything, sure. but a shared, shared principle about how to work, how you want to work, um, that's three, right? Yeah. Four, um, don't rush things. Don't make artificial deadlines that don't mean anything other than what you think in your head. And that means like, for example, don't rush to get a film done cutting corners, whether it be in the pre-production, production, or post-production, all to meet whatever deadline you have set that you have to hit in order if it's a distributor giving you a deadline, okay. If it's you trying to get this one festival, got to really weigh whether or not it's worth it to cut those corners. And the reason why I say that is because in that haste to get there, you will forget certain things that are important. And it's not about just racing to the deadline, it's thinking your plan through very clearly. So it ties into that fourth, fourth or fifth part, which is, Start from the end. Start from the very end and work your way back. Don't start here and go forward without knowing where you're going to end up. And seeing what that place looks like at the very end when you arrive to the finished part of your film or the distribution of your film. Really, and it's like, it's like a, an objective, a clear objective. This is where I need to be at this stage. And you should be, and it should be a logical conclusion because everything should flow forward as it flows backwards as well. Wow. Okay. You won't miss anything that way. Um, review your budget. Look at your budget daily. All the time, even if you're not a guy who writes up the budget or a woman who writes up the budget, whatever it is, study it. Become a student of it um, because you. Here's what will happen, and I just know this from my own experience. We had a problem on the last film. Piece of equipment got broken and would have stopped the whole filming. But knowing that I had what I had in the budget and knowing what I had available, I knew that we could get through it, and I was able to make a split-second decision to start calling and getting. While I was in Riverside, I had to go to L.A., and it was five o'clock and everything closed at six. Oof. So I had to put game mode on. I wasn't gonna get over there. So I had to go, who do we know in LA that we can have once we purchase it, that they can go pick it up and then I can go pick it up from them later that night so then I could drive it back to set. But all of that I did under calm when what had just unfolded in front of me could have been a potential disaster. But because I knew how much money I had, I knew what I needed to do, I knew where to start, and I kept, and, we, and within 30 minutes, we had an answer and a solution, and it was done. Wow. So, so study the budget. Um, it, it will benefit you in ways that you don't even know at the time. Um, so I think that's six. We're at six. <laughs> yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are more. No, uh, I think that the, the most important thing is to have trust in the people that you work with, and that is incumbent on you. In other words, you set the table 
And everybody else that you invite to that table is going to uh, be participating in it. So vet your, you know, people that you're going to work with. For the actors, and this is just when you were doing a micro budget and you don't have lawyers and you don't have these big, you know, like people to control the behavior of others. Don't necessarily go for um, the most talented if it's going to cause you a headache. If you know it's going to cause you a headache and you see red flags, I meet with all the talent one on one after the audition, after the callback, after the final callback. Some of them don't like that process, that's fine. But the fourth and final one is the meeting one on one. And I have to know where their motivations are, what kind of person they are, not as an actor, but as a person who's going to be a person on set that I'm going to be in close quarters with and I'm going to be working with for hours long at a time. So just think. And if you don't find who you want and it doesn't sit, it doesn't agree with you in here, keep looking. Keep looking till the very end. Go to every avenue that you can. I, 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 I did this with our leads. We had, we had tons of talented actors and through the process, you know, it whittled itself down and the opportunity presented itself because I didn't give up, I didn't stop looking and I found people that I just like loved. And from their profession to their, uh, to their person. And, it's, and, and I would work with them again in a heartbeat. Because I, 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 if I have a role, I'll do it. You know, they're, they're just great human beings. Um, and they're wonderfully talented. So, uh, so we're at seven, uh, eight, nine, and ten. Um, I think that, well, I think you just have two more. Two more, yeah. okay. Uh, gosh. Allow yourself to evolve with the work that you're doing. In other words, what you thought once when you started and what happens there on out let that be your journey that guides you. In other words, let that part of the process enrich you and give you that valuable feedback that you want and need in order to grow as a human being, in order to grow as an artist, and in order to grow as a filmmaker. Um, I can't say enough about this because I think it's often that we ignore these things that, that we're human beings first and that we have certain sensitivities and things that bother us and issues that come up and we all are trying if 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 our goal and our focus is about the work and the relationship to it in both ourselves and the people that we're bringing to that table you can achieve so much more i personally believe this just having the experience of doing it you can achieve so much more people will work that little extra harder that you always wanted them to do without asking because you're leading by example and you've brought people into that mix that have the same, same characteristic within themselves as all of a sudden, oh, this person's like this, this person's like this, this person, oh, I'm among people like me. And they're all doing the same thing where you have a sound guy who's like carrying bags out of things that are not his and being there to help you. And you know, it's just, this is what, what makes it worthwhile. It's not the struggle and, the, and all the hardships and everything else that you have to deal with. That's fine, but to override, overcome all of that and deal with it head on, make it, make it come from within you and let that idea and that inspiration and that passion flow and have other people come into it who feel that passion in you and are inspired by it. It's like, this is why I got into filmmaking. I got into it for the art and I'm hoping that that art will give me an opportunity for more art or bigger art or greater art or whatever it is. But this is, that's probably the most important thing I can say is that it's allow yourself, allow yourself to learn from the process and don't be so dogged and fixated on a specific vision that it's not about being contrarian. Or, 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 you know, throwing out what you believe. But let that belief system evolve. Let it grow deeper. Let it get richer. Let it enrich you and the people that you're working from. Because at the end of the day, at, at the end of all of this, when I am an old man, regardless of where I end up, I have all these beautiful memories of working with people and remembering those moments on set and how I felt. And, and that is like getting to relive your life a second time and enjoy it. 
So uh, I know that may be nine, but that's okay. But that that that's two and one right there. <laughs> right. So that was so excellent. So. I think then that's why with um, your last film, I know you have two more, so A Child's Voice, that you felt like even at that premiere and you're like basically closing down Bar Barney's Beanery, mm -hmm. that you felt this synergy that maybe other projects, it was good good times, but there was something different maybe yeah. because you went by those, what, yeah, what you're saying right I now. let the work guide me and the, and the material and my belief system in what we were doing with this movie and, and, and the good it could do um, first. It, it wasn't about being a filmmaker in the, in the, in the sense of producing and, and all the functional stuff. Everybody did their job. They came with their tools to do a great job. And, uh, and so... It, it, it was more about that emotion and that, and that feeling of having created something that everybody was really proud of in themselves, not for just the craft of it. Mm -hmm. It was this, like, we did, some, we did something. Oh, my God. It, it affected people. Oh, my God. And, and, you know, grown women coming out and crying and, and holding on to our actors and saying, I didn't know that this, this existed and that this happened. And, and uh, they don't know each other. I mean, she's, she's coming up, but there was a, a strong reaction. I go, that is so valuable as a human to human thing to connect with another human being that, that, that is quote, not your own. And it spoke to a deeper thing about the movie, which in the, in the child's voice is the calling of the child within us. And the answer to the child that is not you or yours to say, I will protect you. I will help you. I will risk my life because that, that in itself is, is our mammal part, the human part of us that makes us different from a reptile. Do you think the film business is fair? Uh, the film <laughs> industry. Well, uh, the, do I think Hollywood is fair? No. But I don't think it has to be. Okay. And what I mean by that is that they have a right to run their operation as they see fit. Uh, there are consequences to that, obviously. Uh, exclusivity. Uh, and the digital world, obviously, in the last 10 years has obviously changed. You went from, you know, blockbuster video to DVD by mail to streaming and now production company. Same thing, one company. Um, that's phase one, it's a transitional phase. We're in a transformational time. So we'll, I'm not there to tell Hollywood what to do and not to do. They're gonna follow their model as they see fit. Uh, I think they have certain agendas that they wanna get out there and that's fine. They're welcome to do that. But I, I would believe that the only time in Hollywood that there was ever an opportunity for independent filmmakers to be mainstream was in a moment of crisis during the 60s and 70s because of television being in everyone's home, the decline of a uh, box office era, because they'd pretty much been doing the same stuff, right, all the time, it's the same. And so younger audiences were going in who they were trying to hit and they didn't know who Cary Grant was. They just saw an old guy. And then we're kind of at that point now where the youth is so connected online. Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep and all those, I mean, they're, they're kind of like, their legacy, right? Iconic in terms of their brand and their value, but they don't mean anything to this younger generation. There's no relation to, For I mean, they can go back and look at Forrest Gump, but they didn't watch Forrest Gump when they were a child and make that attachment to Tom Hanks as they were watching him grow up in front of our eyes on the screen. So they're going to have to deal, they're going to deal with it however they deal with it. Um, I think the fairness that people want in a system that is not fair, you can spend your time fighting against it or you can spend that same motivation and time doing something to create your, your way. Um, and you don't know where it'll end up. I mean, I would say like if I started like 10 years ago, and where I am today, with these six movies, I'm glad that I own the rights to all of them. Because 
it hasn't even gotten out there to the like if I think in terms of the film industry and the windows and the you know day and date and all that kind of like if you get lost in all of that it's it's what they have done to set the table but if you're an entrepreneur and you're a filmmaker and you're an innovator and you're thinking about like what can I do this system over here for the most part you got to have access and entry points and all, all sorts of things to get in and then move up but you may not get to do your art. I mean, I want people, everybody should, should go for it, right? I'm telling everybody, go for it. But if it doesn't work, try something else. Go directly to the audience. Go directly to the communities that are talking about your issue. Create something that is different and unique from the other things that are being presented. Don't try to be the new, hip, cool, Tarantino, you know. I mean. I understand that people have like they they watch that and they want to imitate it sure. and 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 th they may agree with it too you know it may be something like oh, I really love these movies great take an action genre and maybe take it into a story that is not being covered not being served underserved people underserved groups underserved issues that are not even talked about in the mainstream talked about in Hollywood you'll you'll stand out uniquely maybe if you make enough money Possibly, but look at and I want to say it like here's a perfect example Westworld Season one was phenomenal. I mean that's really about the child rebelling uh, Against its abusers. I mean if you want to go into the the psychological stuff is that you know as they become more aware conscious free choice free will and and um, Basically throwing out their captors or killing them and that's a really dark world, but that's it's kind of like the one percent versus the ninety-nine, if you will, or the power powerful over the powerless. I mean, these are these are uh, you know slaves basically for sex, for murder, for all. okay. You have Black Mirror, and Black Mirror is talking about you know where we could be going with technology and our humanity, and showing you the darker elements and kind of waking you up and going, you know what, that's not that far. Like they're they're kind of the sci-fi, but in reality, are we really that far away? If in the observable realities that we see today. Um, so I think that the responsibility really does not rely on the parent, Hollywood, to take care of you. As so much you have to become the adult, not to lead them, but to create your mark in this world. And if more people do that, then you create a little bit more of a balance where there's a lot of art going on over here and people are paying attention in mass and maybe this group over here that's losing money on doing the same thing over and over again turns its head and goes hey like we did george lucas george lucas all all of steven spielberg all of those guys were a result of film school innovative experimental film and film school david lynch scorsese. how can we ask yeah, scorsese i mean it just and the list goes on um so when you look at it in those terms, everything is not going to always be the same as it always was. And when you have this disruptive technology, and it's not just talking about in some kind of vacuum, it's real application to connect with people and to be able to go directly to the people that want to hear what you have to say, because over here they have you know, everything kind of locked up I mean, you can get in there. I'm not saying it's bad to try and, and get in and try to get your agent, your manager, and getting, you know, like the pitch meeting and all that. I think that's fantastic. But if you're not getting that response that you want, then it's on you to say, I don't have to hate these people over here. I don't have to be anti anything. It's not what this is about. It's not about tearing down the power structure. It's actually about creating your own power structure sure. and amassing that with other people that are like-minded because you can all find each other and start making films together. Start telling these stories. Start doing it with other people. That's how we're, we're getting our success. We're doing it with others who are serving these communities and these groups of people who are ready to hear what we have to say. And to them, we're valuable because we're Hollywood from the outside. We're seen as Hollywood who is doing something about an issue that they care about or a story or a point of view that they care about. Uh, it's up to us what we want to do. Um, but we may need to emotionally detach ourselves from the idea of what is fair and what's not 
and sitting there and you know trying to expect them to change for me no it doesn't mean I dis if they want to work with us I'd love to talk to them I'd love to work with them but I'm talking about doing your work and that being the determining factor is what's fair and what's not fair and how that should affect whether or not you do a movie or tell this story or if I have to conform in order to get into in you know in okay fine but I want to do art and I want to tell stories and I want to make movies and I want people to enjoy those films so if this group is not giving me the opportunity to do that or doesn't just see that I'm a value to them at this particular stage of my career then I'm gonna to go to the people who do. Did you see the movie Quiz Show from 1994? Long time ago, yeah. It kind of reminds me of that. I mean it's, it's a weird analogy but you know it's based on you know this John Turturro's character who's just excellent in the film and he's like this scrappy guy from New York and he knows all the answers to these quiz show questions and every night or, or so the, these American families are glued to their television but after a while they want to replace him yeah. and so Michael uh, Stahlbarg is like the I mean it's just so great but it's a great analogy of of then they put the Ralph Fiennes this like golden boy mm -hmm. and he, you know very bright guy but there's something about him that they feel the American families are going to want to root for this guy mm -hmm. we got it we got it and so it, the movie is Turturro and forgive me for not knowing the character's name, but fighting to keep getting back on that show and it, 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 it can't and he really wants it and the more they tell him no, he just goes crazy. And then basically they, they say he's crazy because right. he wants it so badly. Right. Where um, the Ralph Fiennes is just like this gentleman and, and he makes the cover of Time and so anyway, it's just the, it's sort of this interesting look that of like fairness, you right. know, and, and it, it turns out in the end, I don't, I don't want to give it away, but if you watch it, you see that even when he does wrong, he's still applauded right. because he's seen as this hero and, and he's just painted as that. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and so I, I, it's a weird analogy and I, I can't really put my finger on what Destroying I'm... Destroying the illusion. Okay, that, I guess that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. But I mean, it, it essentially, we're in a, however you want to look at it, we're in a time where an election two years ago blew a hole in reality and there's an opening to look on the outside for the first time and all of this new information is coming in uh, and we as filmmakers need to look at the scope of information and assess its credibility and try to figure out to make sense of what we're seeing and hearing. Human trafficking was not on my radar at all uh, as for, as for an, a social issue of a project that I was gonna do something about. I've seen documentaries on it. I've seen uh, one or two films that have covered it. But it was through that disruption of unpredictable things that came with all of this other information and a journey of learning to understand why we got here, where we are, what's actually going on in the world, not the ones that's presented to us. So you have two, you have a new reality that's kind of emerging for many people, new information that's coming into, you could call it political, really not, but social, cultural, worldwide global events, which we have time if we want to observe and look at through video, through articles, through people on Twitter talking about these issues, debating them in a public forum, uh, conversations that haven't, you know, it's like, it's all out there. It's a whole other world, it's a new frontier. And you can embrace it or you can retreat to the old way. And what I'm saying is it's not about you have to abandon your principles or anything like that. Actually, you become stronger in your resolve to find that there is so much more to this world out there than what we've been presented with. That we can do such great things. It gives me such great hope for humanity in the bigger and broader sense of the long term. When we talk about child care, when we talk about what human trafficking is, what it does, its effects on children long term, what child abuse has in its effects long term on children. And we, we get into this space, but it's not about taking a point of view, it's trying to learn 
through the experience of that information that's coming at you to make sense of it. And then once I discovered after multiple things that were prevented, presented in front of me, fact-based, court, FBI, first count testimonials from people who had endured a lot of this stuff, there was no turning back. I had to, I had to or wanted to do something and that was where I was putting my foot down and, and going in that direction. So um, I think it is, it's, if you're, if you're going to look at yourself as a person <laughs> of importance, whether you do or not, it really doesn't matter, but if you, if you, if you see your job as a filmmaker as being uh, a position of, of social, you know, shaping social, uh, telling social, you know, stories, stories about us, um, we can tell new stories. We can tell a lot of different stories. We can tell stories that haven't ever been told before because today there is this enormous wealth of information out there and there's a lot of BS too, but it's your job. If you want to see it as like, a, you know, I want to, I want to help or I want to shape uh, ideas or I want to bring this voice out, it's our responsibility to find the truth in that. And that's about being a truthful filmmaker as opposed to one that has just a certain idea about how the, we want the world, as in this group over here who have a certain agenda, want to do certain things, they have a total right to do it. But if I am forcing my point of view on them and I'm basically throwing a temper tantrum <laughs> because I'm not getting what I want, mm -hmm. then in reality, that's only going to hurt me. And on top of that, all of the people who you know are being affected by this issue are then going to get further, you know, it's going to be completely ignored because now you're not doing anything because these people over here won't help you when you know the truth and you have your own creativity and your own ideas and you can look at this and go, man, this is something that's really important. I need to find a way to get out there and start telling this story. Have you ever made a movie for more than 250,000? No. Wow. Okay. No. And have people said, there's just no way you're going to do this then? Uh, oh yeah. I mean, I talk to people all the time who are experienced who, you know, micro budget to them is half a million. A uh, quarter of a million is kind of like, that's the lowest they'll go. Uh, and they just can't conceive of it. I mean, if I priced out my movies for what, you know, they, they would cost under normal circumstances, then I would say, yeah, I'd hit a quarter of a million, half, half a million every time. Um, but, you know, we just, we, we plan smart and we shoot you know, the scenes that we need to shoot and we work within our limitations and embrace them. Um, so, I mean, I've had, uh, I can't tell you like how many times, <laughs> I don't think I've had a film shoot even with pickups go past 16 days. Uh, most of it, I mean, our last film we shot principal in, uh, I think it was 10 or 11 days and then did two, two days of pickups. Um, we just were a very efficient group. We didn't work over 14 hours that I can recall. Um, if we did, it may have been one day. Most of it's 12, uh, 12, 13. Everybody gets fed. You know, you just, you just roll with it. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to. I'd love to have a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could probably now, when you read this script, when you say what's more important, the, or what do you do first, the, the script or the budget, so you can probably see red flags like, oh, this is going to really cost, or this is great, it's going to keep it down. Yeah, and, that, and then that's a conversation with the writer. You have to talk to him and say, hey, you know, do we want to, are you open to the idea of changing this given the, given the resources we have financially? Because you know, we kind of did a, an analysis general over analysis and it's going to take this many number of days to shoot so it's got fixed costs in there you know daily rates for everybody putting people up then we've got you know whatever other things we have to do how many actors we have to bring in that kind of thing and 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 you should fight for a compromise but it's one that is a shared vision as opposed to you're right and they're wrong so, but when I read scripts today, um, I'm definitely looking at that and I'm like just seeing it add up and I'm like, okay, locations, days, you know, there's ways that you can do some 
bringing consolidation and stuff like that. So it's not all like, you know, when you're reading in the full story, you just go, oh, there's only like four locations here, four main locations, that's easy. Makes it look like it moves around a little bit more. You know, that kind of stuff. And it's just, I don't determine my working on something in terms of what budget uh, I'm gonna do it at first, right? But I'm gonna assess it from a story level and see what are the story points that we need to hit that you know, maybe we don't have a chase scene, or if we have a chase scene, we shoot it a certain way. So like the, the chase scene in our movie, when you know, he goes to pick up the girl and they shoot. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, I would have loved to have done a whole bunch of other stuff there, but that's, it, and it, it still worked. It still worked, but I had to do, you know, certain angles and, and, and you know, just to sell the idea. And, and in, the, in the editing room, you know, Edgar knew this, but when he was shooting it, and then they had storied, you know, they had done the shot list out. They figured that we can make it, we can sell this in a day. We can do all of that in one day, in a, actually a half a day. We shot that entire uh, chase and rundown scene in a half a day and it, and it, and it worked. So um, yeah, you get, there's, there's ways to get around it, but you just have to be creative. Is your goal moving forward to go past a $250,000 budget or are you, content staying here and knowing that I'm going to tell stories that I want to tell, we're going to find financing our way um, and, and not be beholden to more money, more problems. <laughs> more money, more problems. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's really like if there's something that comes along that I'm really passionate about and, you know, I see that we can do it for X and I'm like, okay, are we, do we want to do this? Do we, do we want to do it without a script supervisor and a first AD? I mean, Edgar does that, you know, as, while he's directing. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the hard part. But in reality, it's not about like, no, we've graduated this level and now I can't, you know, I've never looked at it that way. I just roll up my sleeves. I, I do wardrobe. I do uh, props. I'm doing, you know, like doing everything wherever there's a hand that's needed, right? And it's not because I love doing that, but it's needed. Otherwise, I got to come up with that cash for somebody else to do it. Um, so in short, yes, I would like more money because I'd like to give the time that we would love to have where we could do, you know, all of the things that we have to cut out in editing because we didn't have enough time or we didn't get the actor to be able to get to that, that you know, we didn't have the time to get the actor to be able to get to that that level that we wanted, and we had to, we only had a certain number of takes that we could do for that shot because of the limitations of the budget and time. So these are the things that you have to plan out and know what you're doing in order to execute that and still get a good, you know, finished product. But money doesn't always solve that. So if it, if it's the crux of the issue is money, then I think you're going to fail. If it's innovation and knowing what your resources are and where you need to put them, you know, what scenes you need to focus on. So as a director, if you're focused on getting Academy Award winning moments every single take and every single scene, you're gonna be in deep trouble. Because, because in reality, you have certain story points where you definitely need to work with the actor and you definitely need to build that up because at the story, the point at where you're at in the story is very important because you're coming to the end of the film where everybody is is writing now in that you know they they followed the the first and second act now we're in the home stretch and everything has to pay off so you don't want to compromise where you have to you know go oh my god i spent all of my time up front here front loaded in the story where i really needed to be the most impactful is in this area where I'm seeing the revelations and all of the, you know, all of the turns that are coming, all the structure that we talk about in the screenwriting, all of that has to hit. So you have to make choices because of the limitations. If you have more money, you can, you can just expand on that. It gives you more breathing room, gives you other personnel to come in to take the, the concentration of a director and just focus it solely on the actors, not having to think about the schedule, not having to think about you know, where we are in the script, the continuity, that kind of stuff. It, it, it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, I, I know it's, when people see our films and they go, my God, I can't believe you guys did that with such a small crew and so many few days and so little money. Um, that didn't just happen. It was because it was planned. And I give a lot of that credit to Edgar because he's really great with that. I mean, out of necessity, he's had to do it. 
but the only reason why I would want more money is so that his entire focus could be working with the actors, getting him to the emotional beats that he, that, he, that he really is like desiring because he knows he gets excited by the potential of what he's seeing come out and come through and working with them. And, and it's a trust. And it's just such a beautiful thing. I mean, as a producer, I, I may never direct a movie, but I can always enjoy the trust between an actor and a, and a director working together. And I want to finance that potential. I want to make sure that that money is put in the, in the appropriate places to get the maximum impact so that when the audience sees it, they're like, whoa, they're blown away. Like that was a great performance. That was real. That was, I, I felt I was there. That's what I'm going for. So if it comes at like 30,000 or 50 or 100 or 200 or whatever it is, or millions more, the same, the same result should, should occur. If, if you do everything correctly, if you, fi- if you follow what your passions are, you do all those points that I talked about, I don't think you can fail. Um, you're gonna learn a lot. You may make mistakes, but I don't think you will fail. I think you'll stumble. You'll stumble forward to the finish line with a, with a, a very good product that uh, can be enjoyed not only through the journey of doing that project, but by the people who are then gonna receive it and see it and, and take something from it.